talking about becoming and what that actually means. Um, I guess we can start out with the old pantahrai, you know, everything changes or you can't step into the same river twice or whatever. Um, and that would imply that identity is far too fluid uh, for us to ever pin it down on anything, that nothing is ever the same thing from one instant to the next. Um, in other words, nothing lasts. Nothing ever lasts, and um, yet the process just keeps happening, the becoming of reality, or at least our own becoming, which is kind of bizarre, because you sort of say, okay, nothing ever stays the same, so what is the hour that we're referring to here that is becoming? But if nothing ever stays the same, yeah, it's kind of a, a mind game, um, but it's an interesting one, because it kind of runs counter to our normal attempt to sort of codify reality, to sort of you know make categories that make sense to us, some sort of way to make sense out of this crazy, absurd thing called existence, uh, or whatever it is, whatever we are, we're attempting to sort of say that there are things around us, that things exist, or whatever. But we also know, deep down, that everything comes and goes. Everything. Universes, one would presume, when you think of things like the Big Bang and what preceded it, or what will come after, the winding down of our universe. Um, so, you sort of see this sort of strange, chaotic state of affairs. Um, that when you consider what becoming actually is, when you consider the implications of Pantahrai, um, no fixed point ever. <laughs> uh, and when you add to that the fact that we somehow want a fixed point, um, you're kind of in a bit of a bind, aren't you? I refer to existential panic quite frequently. Um, and in a way, like Petr Vessel Sopfe in his Last Messiah, I agree that um, existential panic is a pretty horrific state, and it accounts for a lot of our, um, I would call it shoehorning of identity onto the universe, onto what's around us, when there, it, it really isn't there phenomenally or absolutely. It's just for our own purposes. It works, so let's do it. Let's put an identity on something that ultimately it doesn't really deserve. <clears throat> now, Zopfe says that existential panic is essentially insurmountable. It's the absolute horror at the center of existence. But why is becoming, why is the absolute mad multiplicity of everything um, necessarily horrifying. Um, I'll be the first to admit that most people, if they were able to actually, and, and this includes me too, <laughs> uh, if they were actually just able to sort of shut everything else out, all the, um, the apparent variety of the universe and see it as an endless process or a process that has no beginning or ending that we can identify, uh, at least with the tools at hand, um, I can see how most people would find that horrific. It would blow the mind out. Um, I'm fascinated by the Hindu view of time, or the, at least the tantric view of time, in that <clears throat> Like, you know, you see on the Indian flag, there's just a wheel, um, and we kind of have a nod to this, um, this sort of circular or wheel-like repetitive sort of view of time or whatever, in that the dials of our clocks are round, or at least the older ones, that, you know, people who actually use those kind of clocks with faces on them. Um, our dating system says that, you know, it's 2015 and it'll never be 2015 again, but of course that's just an anchor that we placed arbitrarily ourselves uh, around uh, the alleged birth date of one of the major uh, theological figures in human history. Um, <clears throat> 
but right now it's Friday. It'll be Friday again. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> and even Fridayness is uh, determined by the fact that I live on Earth and, you know, the 28 day cycle of the human reproduction, uh, the female human reproduction, uh, reproductive system, sort of, you know, we've broken that up into four pieces. Again, that's just an artifact that we've used to sort of create something that we call Friday or a month or whatever. Um, none of this stuff actually exists. Uh, but, you know, for our own purposes, to make life manageable, predictable, digestible, we create these things. I don't know if we'd, we would, uh, we could say that we're doing it consciously, um, or if we, even if we do it deceitfully, because I don't think that we're attempting to deceive ourselves. I think, as I say, it's just sort of, when you consider the, the, the implications of Pantahrai, or just becoming in and of itself, um, I think that most people are enough, that the, the the consequences of thinking about that are enough to drive a lot of people mad um, <clears throat> if you think about it too much. If you can't think about it, then by all means, go for the life preservers. Go to, you know, go for all the stuff that we've got, the stuff that Nietzsche says belongs to the herd, the ideas of God, country, uh, nine to five, walking down the street, all that kind of thing, the, the, the sort of the anchors that we all... Uh, exist in every day, even though there's no ultimate reality to any of them. Um, or at least there's no lasting reality to any of them. It's all just becoming. <clears throat> but as I say, is it inevitable that we should be horrified by this? That this should disorient us to the point where um, we really should just insist on things like identity, non-contradiction, and excluded middle and everything, if we don't do that, we will simply go mad in a state of wild existential panic. How about feeling, my God, I'm free of these things, or never mind my God, but, <laughs> you know, uh, these things are weights around my legs. This, this, These life preservers that we've created to make sense out of reality. Um... I mentioned uh, a while back in my Atheism versus India Revisited thing when I was talking about karma and the view of time. It's the, the car, again, the car going up a street. And we are essentially in the back seat looking at the rearview mirror watching reality go by us like this. <clears throat> now, again, the suggestion is that what you should do is turn around and look over the driver's shoulder through the windshield and see time that way instead of seeing events just happening and going into the immediate and distant pasts. Um, but again, the Hindus portray that um, often as looking into the face of a monster. They usually show um, a monster or at least something frightening um, with an open mouth and all these objects coming out of it, which is the eternal becoming of everything of reality. Um, the endless coming into existence and going out of existence, which is essentially the same process. Because what you know, what you see in, in, in each direction, ultimately, or in each direction, when you look backwards into the buildings going by this way, or you look forward into the mouth of the maw, I guess, of... Uh, of uh, the monster that is spitting all these things out, this becoming, um, <clears throat> that can be a disorienting thing. So I think people prefer to look backwards. But can you look forward and not be destroyed by it the way Zapfi um, implies? Is becoming necessarily horrifying? Um... I think that one, one could say that it, it, it's horrifying provided you're not ready to look at it, provided you still have those anchors, that you would have those axioms that you, um, that you rely on to make sense of reality. Um, and this horror that kind of underpins all of it, provided, you know, again, it's a horror that's not absolute, it's a horror that simply is a condition contingent upon not understanding what becoming is it actually is. 
that you're actually doing it, whether you, you're horrified by it or not. It doesn't really make much difference. Um, <clears throat> it's only horrifying if you rely upon those anchors. And I think that one of the cruelest things that one can do is to sort of deliberately deprive someone of one of their anchors. Because what people will do is they will go insane if they if, if that's happening. I think that what we're seeing right now happening to the Islamic world is exactly that. They're being now deprived of their anchors by a, a, uh, an anarchic and chaotic and far more flexible system uh, of thought and of social organization than they have. They, and they have no way of withstanding it. Even blind terrorism won't change that. Um, and I think that what ultimately what motivates it all is the fact that they rely on these anchors. They rely on the anchors provided by Islam. And those anchors are now being demolished with apparent ease by the West. And this drives, I'm sure, a few people insane because they can't handle not being able to make sense out of reality in the way that they're accustomed to making sense out of it. Um... But is that inevitable? That's the question that I keep asking. Is is the monster always a monster? Um, I think that it's a heck of a challenge to pose to yourself to say, can you ride that tiger? Can you ride that wave? Can you um, just uh, go with the flow and not have to grasp at bits of wreckage floating by to sort of cleave to, to sort of say, look, we've got to have something to make sense out of this reality. Um, maybe reality doesn't make sense in any way that we can, that we've taught ourselves to measure it by. Maybe it simply doesn't work uh, that way. Maybe all of our tools are inadequate. I, I think that they are, and as I say, it's a, you know, kicking away all the props that you've, you've created can be a terrifying experience, but it's not, I don't think that it's guaranteed to be terrifying. Um, <clears throat> the only thing is, if you're truly hooked on those life preservers, on if you're hooked on making sense of reality, of seeing reality in terms of anything that the mind can sort of grab onto, um, at least in terms of permanency or absoluteness or whatever, um, maybe you'd better stay there <laughs> if you if you're not if you're not prepared to give those up, if you're not prepared to give up something to sort of structure reality. Um, now, you sort of, you would sort of think, what's a guy like me doing spouting off about this when I don't live a completely um, renunciant life or anything like that? I, I, you know, for whatever reason, I live a regular life. I think that it's just a question of emphasis. You have to sort of say, all right, um, everything is changing but it's not real, but something in me requires at least some semblance of order to it, so I will give it a provisional order that I know is provisional and go from there. That strikes me as, you know, the sanest way to approach things like becoming versus identity. Um, identity is not necessarily real, but something in us seems to require it to prevent us from going a little bit crazy. Um, and I would say it's a useful thing as a provisional sort of compromise with the ultimate nature of the universe, which is nothing ever stays the same. This is a very convoluted video, and it's very difficult for me to sort of maneuver this and in, in uh, this sort of concept in the way that I'd like it to, but uh, I'm not going to edit it true to form. Um, <clears throat> What I'm fascinated by, though, is what is the origin of this horror? What is the origin of this feeling of extreme disorientation when, um, when you understand, or if you choose to think that, um, we are in a state of perpetual and unending flux, us and everything else is? Um, <clears throat> is that so horrifying? What is it that makes it so horrifying? Um, again, one is forced to conclude, or at least 
I seem to be forced to conclude that it's simply that we are hooked on these anchors. Hooked on these anchors. What an interesting uh, turn of phrase. I didn't even mean to do that. Um, but it does look that way. Um, only the more sort of cerebral or I would call them bold um, self-reflecting philosophies seem to even posit the idea that it's possible to come to terms with becoming and flux and not go mad. Um, I seem to be more comfortable with it than most people I speak to. Um, although ultimately I think that if I were to actually face that monster with its maw open with all the all these things coming at me, I think it would probably probably at least cause some sort of overload or breakdown or whatever. Um, again, I'm as hooked on gravity and on Main Street and on 9 to 5 and on up and down as anyone else is. I try to be mindful of that, um, but I would, I would say that most people require props, but there are traditions that say that you can actually face the flux of things and not be destroyed by it. Um, and again, that strikes me as um, meditation, um, reflection, self-examination, asking yourself constantly, what does it mean to, to be me? Um, and you've got to be careful with even words like that, because when you sort of say, be, be and me, what does that mean in the face of becoming? Well, something is becoming. Something is experiencing all this becoming. It, uh, it's a fascinating thing, and I think that it has to come, be come at from elliptical angles, from um, ways that, you know, say, we can only intuit. We can only sort of guess at what is actually happening because all of our tool tools are based upon ideas that ultimately don't stand up to constant flux, like logic. Logic doesn't stand up in terms of flux because logic relies on those three axioms, and those three axioms are just axioms. They're life preservers. They're, they're anchors meant to help us make sense of reality. Um... If you're that kind of a person, by all means, don't question these things. This is the old Lovecraftian um, dilemma. Don't go in there because you don't really want to know what's in there. But some people are okay with going in there and looking at it, or they think that they are, or they, you know, they're willing to take risks, or at least in small ways, to try and take a peek in that door to see what flux really looks like. Um, I seem to be one of those people. I'm, I'm insatiably curious and rather reckless with this. Um, <clears throat> it's just in my nature, I guess. But other people just sort of say, oh, I'm not doing that. Forget it. Uh, you know, I just want to watch my favorite show and go to the office every day and uh, have sex with my girlfriend and that kind of thing. You know, that, That's enough for me. Sure. Um, Nietzsche again. If you want a quiet life, then believe. If you want to know, then inquire. Some people, I guess, just don't need to know what is going on here, what this flux thing is, what the ultimate nature of that monster is when we turn around in the car and look over the driver's shoulder and see those things coming at us out of its mouth. We don't really need or they don't really need to do that. So why bother people with those sorts of things? Some of us want to know. <laughs> I might not be as reckless as some people are, um, but I'm not as frightened as the whole idea of becoming in, in, in constant flux as some people apparently are. Um, I seem to be. In as much as I'm possible, uh, it's possible for me to comprehend this. I seem to be okay with it. Um, I don't think that would have been true for every point in my life, and it might not be true in the future. I don't know. Um, but whether or not I'm comfortable with it, 
doesn't really make much difference, does it? Uh, it's happening, isn't it? Um, anchors versus constant drifting. Uh, or again, is there a way to take control of the process? And what does that mean? 